So I am privileged tonight to be with Rabbi Dr. Simcha Raphael from Philadelphia, right. here in Scottsdale, Arizona, and uh, the author of many books, but uh, our conversation tonight is about Jewish views of the afterlife, one of the preeminent scholars on this particular issue. And I would like to ask you just, how did you originally get interested in this topic? So people think about life and death issues based on their personal experience. Mm -hmm. So when I was 21 years old, uh, my closest friend at the time was killed in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And I used to be young and foolish, now I'm just foolish, but then I thought I knew everything, but somehow dealing with death like that mm -hmm. really knocked the wind out of me. Mm -hmm. And I was a little bit of a mystic, a seeker, and I began to ask, what does Judaism have to say about life after death? And in those years, there was almost an uncomfortable embarrassment mm -hmm. about afterlife. We didn't really believe in that. that, that I could find more in Eastern religions with the gurus and right. the swamis than I could talking to rabbis and Jewish educators. So after a little while, my teacher, Reb Zalman, said, oh, afterlife, you want to learn about afterlife? Go here and here and here. And began to point me into pre-modern Jewish texts, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century. And I began to find this whole world mm -hmm. of Jewish teachings about life after death. And eventually, I wrote the book that I would have wanted to read when I was 21. My closest right. friend was killed in a car accident. Wow, wow. So um, why, why is it, do you think, that so many Jews don't talk about the afterlife don't, or don't want to talk about it. What is it either in Jewish history or in sort of the Jewish psyche that puts some distance to this topic? Well, I heard, and I don't know whether it's an apocryphal legend or, or not, that when the Jews came through Ellis Island, uh -huh. they threw their tefillin into, the, into New York Harbor mm -hmm. because they wanted to be Mama down there. Right. And there was a certain kind of sense with modernity and, and the intellectual humanism and secular and scientific thinking of the 20th, 20th century that there was a kind of stepping away from the kinds of ideas that were non-rational, that were mystical. Mm -hmm. And along with that came a kind of rejection about teachings about life after death. Mm -hmm. So modern Jews were taught, Judaism believes in the life and the living, the here and now. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that's, you know, that's not the case. And also, uh, when we think about the impact of, of the Holocaust in, our, in, in, in the 20th century, after the Holocaust, nobody wanted to talk about life after death. Mm -hmm. After the Holocaust, the, the, the imperative is to settle refugees and to guarantee the existence of the state of Israel. Nobody wanted to talk about what happened to six million souls. But if we travel back in time, we go to the world of... Isaac Bashev a singer or fiddler on the roof. Mm -hmm. Remember, I think it's from a Sarah who comes through from the afterlife being offering a shidduch or some opinion on her, on her granddaughter. And go to the world of the Hasidic Rebbe's and the Kabbalistic masters. There was never any question. So it's scientific thinking, it's, it's modernity, it's Holocaust, and it's also, well, the Christians believe in that and we really don't. So mm -hmm. we lost touch with it. And my work has been to say, no, Yes, we believe in life and the living, but we, there's also a rich legacy of Jewish traditions mm -hmm. on life after death. Yeah, so, so uh, why, why is this important? Why is it important for Jews to think about afterlife? I do a lot of work as a, as a bereavement counselor. I work as a hospice chaplain. And it's not as if I'm saying, well, afterlife is the best thing since sliced bread. But we, as Jews, often don't have a template for addressing our kinds of questions about what happens at the moment of death? What happens beyond it? What does it mean to say Kaddish? What does it mean to say, to, to, to say Yisker or to, to observe a yard site? And so while our rituals have a certain kind of psychological function, they work, people often have a kind of spiritual yearning to process grief and loss mm -hmm. and death and dying. So at least you want to say, well, we do have a Jewish understanding. I always say to people, the meaning making that you do mm -hmm. is up to you. I'm not saying adopt it. I'm, I don't say to people, buy my belief. I say buy my book, but that's a different right. topic of right. conversation. Yeah. And so 
people often need to go to Eastern religions or Shirley MacLaine or some of these different kind of new agey teachings to find some meaning when dealing with death and loss. And I say, no, no, no. We have those teachings. We just need to make them more accessible and, 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 and pro provide a kind of contemporary framework for, for, mm -hmm. for them. And that's, as a psychologist, that's what I do. Right, yeah. So if most Americans were asked, what is a general Christian belief? You know, of course, it has lots of strands and complexities to it. But one might say it's divided into heaven and hell, and believers will go to heaven and non-believers will go to hell, or maybe if it's a little more liberal, good people will go to heaven and not good people will go to hell. So getting into the nuts and bolts of Jewish thought, how, and we don't have to contrast it to another theology, but looking at, at the Jewish history of, of this theology, well, first of all, what categories would you break it up into versus like rational versus mystical, you know, biblical versus other area versus other eras? Areas and what are some of the common themes about about the about the belief of what the Jewish afterlife is? Well, because there's three thousand years of evolution of Jewish thought, there is three thousand years of evolution of, of of Jewish views about life after death. Yeah. So in biblical tradition, mm -hmm. there's not a sense of, of an up or down or, or a heaven uh -huh. hell. But when when Jacob dies, he says, and Jacob was gathered to his ancestors. Or when Abraham said, it arranges to bury Sarah in the cave of Machpelah, and then, and then Yitzchak and, and Jacob both say, I want to get back to the cave of Machpelah. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if the ancient biblical world has some sense of, while you're alive, you stay with the family here, and then when you die, you go out to be with the family over there. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a heavenly world. Mm -hmm. it's, it is, in the understanding of the ancient Near East, it's an underworld. Mm -hmm. Or a little bit later in, in the book of Samuel, when Saul goes to the witch of Endor to call up from the underworld the spirit of Samuel. I mean, he's sort of dialing 1-900 psychic. Uh -huh. He's calling, and, and it's not, let me talk to Samuel who's in heaven. Let me bring him up from the underworld. And it's not an evil underworld because Samuel was a good guy and Samuel ends up in the underworld. So that's a very early kind of view of some under realm we call Sha'ol, that in the earliest stages is, is, is neither good nor bad, it's amoral, not necessarily a place of punishment. Later Sha'ol in Psalms becomes a place of punishment with the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. which is for, for a historical footnote is like second century before the common era. That's the first time we get any kind of reference to the good shall enter a realm of the righteous and the evil shall enter mm -hmm. a realm of punishment. By the time the, the, the scene shifts to rabbinic Judaism, we have a notion of, of Gan Eden and, and Gehenna. And Gehenna is an underworld of torment for the rabbis. It wasn't eternal damnation, whereas Christianity goes eternal damnation. The rabbis go the maximum length of time in Gehenna. Mm -hmm. For most people, it's 12 months. Mm -hmm. When the Kabbalistic tradition, and I'm giving you a very quick right, thumb, thumbnail course. sketch, but when the Kabbalistic tradition comes, they're talking a lot more about kind of a process of purification. Mm -hmm. As I learned from my own teacher, teachings on afterlife are not about geography. It's not a place where mm -hmm. one goes to. I, 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 I might mention this later, my son lives in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, and on my way to the airport in Indianapolis, there's always a sign that says, hell, avoid hell, repent. So I have to check my GPS to see if I'm going <laughs> in the right direction. So the, the literal view, the fundamentalist view, is there's an underworld of hell and torment, and there's, a, there's some world of, of angels and clouds and all that in heaven. <clears throat> in the Jewish understanding, in the mystical understanding, as we die, there's some kind of process of purification, and Gehenna is clearing up all of the unresolved pieces of our life experience. If I'm broidous with you, if I'm upset with you, and I, I, I think about you a, a year later, I could be really, really pissed. So when we die, it's said that there's some residue of unresolved grief and guilt and sadness and shame and we get a little bit of time like in rehab to sort of process that. So that's how the Kabbalists understand what Gehenna is. Mm -hmm. And then Gana Aden becomes 
a kind of harvesting of our highest spiritual potentialities. Mm. I say to people, how much time, how much money have you put into your gun aid account? Are you only going to be able to afford a Motel 6? Are you going to be able to afford a quality inn? Mm. Or how about a nice uh, hilltop apartment right. somewhere uh, in the mountains of Sedona? So there's a moral challenge there. Yeah. The bottom line on all of this is don't worry about afterlife. Live a good life. Mm -hmm. Live a good life. Live a meaningful life. Clear up your relationships. But that doesn't mean we don't believe in life after death. Right, right. That doesn't mean yeah. we believe. And then there's some literature that talks about the visionary things that happen to people as they're dying. Uh, at the hour of a man's departure from the world, his father and his relatives gather around him. And, and, and they accompany him to the place where it's to abide, it says in the Zohar. And then people have near-death experiences where they see a deceased relative. And people who are working with, with people who are dying, the nurses often see that somebody who said, oh, my mother, my mother, and they have a vision. So our rabbis had that information a long time ago. So part, so part of what I think I heard you saying about your belief, informed by Jewish sources, right. is that you believe in a, a tempo, in, excuse me, a spatial non-corporeal um, yes. sort of realm of consciousness. Right. It's not holding hands with our loved ones physically, but some realm of consciousness right. that exists beyond right. this world. Right, right, right. Well, the, the, the philosophical question yeah. that underlies this whole conversation is, does one have a belief that consciousness survives bodily death? Mm -hmm. Our Western materialistic science says consciousness is a product of the firing of synapses of the brain. Right. And when the brain stops firing, ain't nothing happening. Mm -hmm. Dead is dead. And that's the materialistic model. Right. And then we're changing that model. We're evolving something because near-death experiences are, are changing. People are, are flatlined. They're completely dead. And then they come back and say, oh, I noticed that when I was in the opera, when, when I was lying on the table, I saw a little tag in, in on the light in the operating room and it said, Made in Los Angeles in 2005, and right. they look, and there's a little tag, and it says, like, you know, California 2005, and that doesn't mm -hmm. fit in, 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 in the paradigm. So there are new trends that are emerging in modern consciousness research, near death experience mm -hmm. studies, that turn out to have a lot of parallels with classical. So bracketing the, bracketing the, the, the body survival and consciousness realm. If there's no identity, meaning if detached from the body and detached from memory, and one is merely in a realm of consciousness, if there is not self-identity, to what degree is that still oneself? Well, it seems that there's some process of clearing up the residue of individual life. Uh -huh. that, that in this lifetime, I'm born male in such and such a culture, this is simchanus. And in the early stages, and, and it is very much of a, of a multi-stage journey, mm -hmm. there's some residue of simchanus that has to get cleared up. Mm -hmm. At some point, and again, the Zohar used beautiful language, that one removes the terrestrial garments and one puts on the celestial garments. Uh -huh. And so in putting on the celestial garments, we move from our individual identity to more of uh, a trans-individual identity. I guess I haven't used that language before, but it might be that. And then at some point in the mystical writings, one even goes beyond that to merge with Gufa de Malka, to enter into the body of the king. Mm -hmm. And so there is some sense in, 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 in a minority of places, but in some texts that... that it's almost like a kind of nirvanic emergence mm -hmm. with the Godhead like we see in Eastern religions. Yeah, beautiful. So, but I don't remember yeah. that since the last time I was right. incarnated. So let, let me ask you a quick question about theodicy, just to remind us, Le Leibniz coined the phrase theodicy as the philosophical notion that we are justifying God within the face, uh, as an omniscient and a ben and benevolent being within the face of evil. How, <clears throat> how do we do that? There's been lots of back and forth over time. And one of the answers that we find and, and, uh, is, is Gilgalim. The answer of reincarnation as returning to this world, that, okay, the wicked prospered here and the good suffered here, but that's explained by the fact that people not will just go to Olam Haba, the next world, but will return to this world, and we can't see that full picture. I wonder if you find Gilgalim to be uh, a, 
you know, I know there's a number of mystical teachers in, in Jewish thought that, that talk about Gilgalim. I wonder if you think it's pervasive enough to say it's a strong Jewish theology, and if it is, if you find it to be a compelling response to the problem of theology. Well, from the 10th, 12th century on, I would say for Habahir, yeah. the whole notion of reincarnation enters into Jewish thought. Mm -hmm. And for a while, it very much was normative. Mm -hmm. So much so that if, if we looked at the art scroll Sidur, uh -huh. which is pretty mainstream Orthodox uh -huh. prayer book, at, on the Kriyat Shema Hamitah, the prayer the one says... Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. Says, I say it every night. It says, God forgive that's me right. for anyone harmed in this incarnation. Or right. In this incarnation. It's unbelievable. So people get blown away by that. Right. It's right in there. Right. So... There's there's a lot of different strands. At some point, the Kabbalists were saying one could reincarnate into animal bodies, and in another place, they're saying they're not. And some remember with 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 all due respect to my my uh, Jewish feminist friends, in some way, some of the texts were made by men for men, uh -huh. and so if men have a seminal. Uh, emission, there's a problem with that, and you have to come back to clean that up. I mean, there's a whole mm -hmm. sexual strand around around Gilgulim. What I find helpful to think about as, as a psychologist, it may be that we have to clean up, we have to clean up our, our, our relational stuff, mm -hmm. but there might be some pieces of learning and growing that we don't get in one incarnation, and there, there are multiple mm -hmm. incarnations. Yeah. This is kind of an aside, but it, it's yeah. dialoguing with, with yeah. this question. A woman came up to me the last time I was lecturing, and she said, I wasn't born Christian, I was born 1947, mm -hmm. and as a very young girl, I began to have all kinds of memories that seemed to be about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And do you know anything about that? Well, I had to tell her that there's a whole phenomena of people who claim to have memories of having died in the Holocaust. Now, I can't scientifically prove all of that, but anecdotally, the stories are quite fascinating. So, I'm not sure how that fits in with your question about theodicy, but I, but I think it, what, what I would want to say is that we do have these Jewish teachings, and it may give some meaning and some context to those kinds of of questions, um, and this woman, you know, she wasn't raised Jewish, and yet there she she said, you know, I I love Judaism, and I, I seem to, as soon as I learned about all of these Jewish rituals and practices, they seem very very familiar. Right, to me. right. You know, it's beautiful. It's uh, we we often think of Judaism as very behavioral, but in fact, there's a much deeper spiritual side to what we're engaging with, and I think a lot of that, and part of it, to forward to your book from Reb Zalman, he's one of the players who helps to bring this back to us. You know, one of the ideas that's been really meaningful to me for a long time has been Maimonides' teaching, and, and it's beyond Maimonides as well, of course, that also righteous Gentiles have a place in Olam Haba in the world to come. That we are not an exclusivist religion that believe, well, I guess there are strands in our thought as well, yes. but we see Maimonides and, and Strong, right, the greatest philosopher, some might say, that say that it's beyond just Jews. You know, and I, and I, I want to, I mean, it's very important to me, I wonder, if, you know, how that speaks to you as well, that, that particular issue. If you get a lot of questions about that, that's my last question tonight. Well, certainly there are particularistic strands within Judaism, right. and there are universalist strands within Judaism. Um, on, on that day, God's name will be one and only one, is my sense of, at, at some point, our Jewish teachings will be more universally perceived not not because they're Jewish teachings but because they have a certain kind of wisdom for yeah. the Jewish world. And, and and to sort of dovetail back to the conversation here, I think that Jewish teachings on death and afterlife have the potential to make a significant contribution to the evolving 21st century science of death and dying. That there are things that I have learned in studying about life after death that have wonderful applications in terms of how we offer pastoral support to people who are dying and to people who are grieving whether or not they are they are Jews. Mm -hmm. So that I wanna I want to hold Judaism as as a kind of database and a, a resource of spiritual wisdom that is useful for Jews and available to anyone who, who comes to it and can bring Jewish wisdom into the world in a way that makes the world a better place, which is, I think, ultimately what we're trying to do. Yeah, beautiful. So make sure to check out Rabbi Dr. Simcha Raphael's works. 
Uh, in particular, you might start with this, the Jewish views of the afterlife, which you can find on Amazon. Thank you so much. And if yeah. I could mention yes, please, yeah. daatinstitute.net. D-A-A-T dot institute dot net. Thank you. Thank you.